Some of the main focuses of my channel over the years have been a combination of home labbing and gaming. And then of course, combining them to play games on your home lab server. My thoughts being, if you have extra horsepower just sitting there, you might as well put it to use. Today we're going to take a look at this GPU that I picked up for less than $100 that might be able to turn your home server into a headless gaming rig. Welcome back to Craft Computing, everyone. As always, I'm Jeff. The late night eBay surfing bug caught me again, and the result is this AMD Radeon Pro GPU. If you follow the channel, you know my two favorite things are building home lab servers and then gaming on them. And over the years, I've had my fair share of both successes and failures. So why should you bother using your home lab server as a gaming PC? Well, for starters, most home labs are filled with idle hardware. Sure, it's nice to have a ton of storage filled with Linux ISOs to stream to your TVs, but unless you're running active databases, cracking the human genome, or are already filled with virtual machines, you might have a bunch of CPU horsepower just waiting to sink its teeth into something. Adding a GPU to your home lab server will allow you to create a virtual machine that you can use as a remote gaming rig, and there's a number of reasons you might want to do that. Maybe you need a gaming PC for your kids to use, but they only have a Raspberry Pi. You can remotely connect a Raspberry Pi to your server and render games through the graphics card. Or maybe you want to host a LAN party at your house so you can invite people to game on whatever devices that they have on them, be it laptops or phones. Maybe you want to remotely access a gaming machine to use when you're on the go without spending $1,000 on a dedicated gaming handheld. There are two ways to turn your server into a gaming rig. Number one, install an enterprise-focused GPU with proprietary drivers to bifurcate them into smaller chunks, allowing multiple virtual machines to take advantage of a single GPU, often at the expense of both total performance and actual expense in the form of money. Option number two is way more straightforward. Slap a GPU into your server, pass it directly through to a virtual machine, and start playing games. And it's that second option that we're gonna play around with today. Last month, I snagged this card on eBay, mainly to see if it would be a great option for using in a gaming VM. I wanted a GPU that was a single slot, used relatively low power, and had 8GB of video memory for 1080p and medium gaming. And what I found was this. This is the AMD Radeon Pro W5500 8GB. Based on the same Navi 14 and RDNA architecture as the Radeon RX 5500 GPU, the consumer card wasn't exactly well received. First off was the $170 retail price tag, along with having only 4GB of video memory. The W5500 does have a slightly lower TDP, but it also has 8GB of video memory, meaning 1080p gaming should be no problem. And for just $90 on eBay, the single slot GPU might make the perfect addition to your home lab for a simple gaming machine. While it's not going to knock the doors off of modern AAA titles, it is still faster than not only the Steam Deck, but most modern handhelds powered by a 7840U or HX370 APU. But we're getting ahead of ourselves. How exactly do you set up a virtual gaming machine in the first place? I'm going to be using Proxmox in this example, but just about any hypervisor that supports PCI Express pass-through should work just fine. You'll also need enough storage for your VM, both for the OS install and for your game installs. For my virtual machine, I'm going to configure it with 12 gigabytes of memory, 500 gigabytes of storage in a virtual disk, along with 12 threads of CPU for compute. This is on my Epic Genoa 9554 64-core server, and with 12 threads, it should be about on par with a 6-core 12-threaded CPU from a Zen 2. But don't expect much difference here in performance even if you're still on an x99 home server though, as most games are going to be GPU limited with this card. On top of a server, storage, and a graphics card, you'll also need a dummy display dongle, as GPUs need to think there's a monitor plugged in for remote streaming to work. GPUs don't know what to do if there's no monitor to render onto, and a display dongle like this emulates a display at pretty much whatever resolution that you want. And that plugs into your graphics card, just like that. To start off, we're gonna create the VM and install the OS before passing through the graphics card, as once the GPU is installed, we're gonna lose local video access through the Proxmox web interface. I'm installing Bazite, the Linux Fedora distro designed for gaming. I went with Linux as it should be a more efficient environment, given the limited resources that we're going to have when running in a VM, and I didn't wanna deal with some of the headaches that Windows would bring along. We'll also be using the full desktop version of Bazite, not the SteamOS-inspired version. And the reason why is pretty simple. We're not going to be accessing this machine with a keyboard, mouse, and monitor plugged into the back of our server. Rather, we'll need to access it remotely via an application called Sunshine. 
Sunshine is an open source implementation of NVIDIA's GeForce Now streaming protocol. On a client PC, you can access Sunshine via another open source app called Moonlight, which is a remote client optimized for gaming. Sunshine needs to be started from the desktop of your Linux distro to enable a remote connection, and cannot be run from the SteamOS interface alone. So you're going to need the desktop installation of Bazite, not the SteamOS version. When installing Bazai, you'll create a user account for the OS. We're going to create an account without a password, again to help ease the setup for remote access when we're installing Sunshine. Once Bazai is installed, there's only a couple things we need to do to prep the system for the GPU. First off, you'll want to open a terminal window and type in you just set up dash sunshine enable. This will install Sunshine and allow you to configure your system for remote access. Once installed, click on the Sunshine icon on the taskbar and select Open Sunshine. This will open a web browser where you'll configure a user and password for the admin page. With the password all set, go ahead and log into Sunshine. From your client machine, whether it's a phone, laptop, handheld, or just another computer, open up Moonlight and connect to your VM. The first time you connect, you'll be given a PIN number which you need to enter into Sunshine to allow the connection. Put the pin into Sunshine and your client PC will be authorized to connect without asking from now on. Next, we need to have your local user log into the desktop at boot rather than defaulting to the login screen. This is because Sunshine cannot run from the system space at the login screen. A user needs to be logged in for it to function. In Bazite, go to Settings, Users, and then Enable Automatic Login. You'll also want to disable idle timeout or logout in the power settings, as we don't want your user kicked back to the login screen for any reason, as Sunshine is not allowed to see that user interface. Finally, Bazite includes a tool called Ignition, which allows you to auto start programs when a user logs in. Steam automatically starts when you log in, and in fact, you can have it boot directly into big picture mode if you're looking for a Steam Deck-like experience. But for now, you'll want to enable Sunshine at startup so you can connect remotely. Once all that's done, you'll want to reboot your virtual machine to make sure all of your settings are saved and that Sunshine does boot up automatically. After that, go ahead and shut down your virtual machine so we can pass through your local GPU. Depending on your exact hypervisor, you might need to run through some additional steps to allow your GPU to be passed through to a VM. In Proxmox, you'll need to disable video output on any card that you want to use inside of a virtual machine. I've linked a quick cheat sheet down in the video description where you can output your video card's PCI ID info and then disable video output with a single write command. Once that's done, you'll need to reboot your server for it all to take effect. And with that, there's not much left to do but pass through the GPU to your virtual machine and start gaming. In Proxmox, we're going to click on the VM, go over to Hardware, and then add a PCI device. I'll find the W5500 in the drop-down list and select it. You'll also want to check a couple boxes before continuing. First off, the All Functions checkbox passes through any downstream PCIe devices that are attached to the GPU, like the built-in audio device, which is pretty important for playing games. Secondly, the Primary GPU box will disable the default software GPU inside the VM and instead force the system to use your actual graphics card. Now, an important thing to remember here is that once you disable the software GPU device, you'll no longer be able to access the VM from the web interface, as the software GPU is no longer rendering the desktop. This is why we needed to enable remote connections to the VM before adding the graphics card. Once the VM is booted up, you can connect to it via Moonlight on the client that you configured earlier, and you'll be dropped onto the Linux desktop where you can use it like any other PC. Install software, play games, all from the comfort of whatever device that you'd like to use. Now, remember earlier when I said the W5500 was faster than pretty much any gaming handheld that's on the market today? Here's where we start looking at performance. In 3D Mark Firestrike, we get a graphics score of 11,403, putting it around 23% faster than even the latest handhelds powered by the AMD HX370. The W5500 is also around 45% faster than the Ryzen 7840U from the last generation, even at its top TDP of 30 watts. And still, we're more than double the speed of the Steam Deck. Again, while you're not going to be setting the world on fire with the W5500 in terms of performance, modern gaming handhelds are still able to play most games at 1080p and low to medium settings, so this is definitely going to exceed even those expectations. This isn't going to be a full benchmark video, as I just wanted to give some idea of what you can expect with this particular GPU. But my playtesting has been pretty solid. In Kingdom Come Deliverance 2, at 1080p and medium settings, we're getting around 55 frames per second on average. Pretty solid, especially compared to the 45 frames per second on the One X Fly F1 Pro and the AMD HX370 that I tested last month. 
Rocket League is of course no trouble at all. Even at 1080p and max settings, we see around 215 frames per second on average. Teardown is always a blast to play if you're wanting to blow things up. And on the W5500 at 1080p and medium settings, we get an average of around 70 frames per second, sometimes pushing that up to 85. Fire, physics, and explosions seem to have little effect as well, making the game perfectly playable overall. Tiny Tina's Wonderlands, again at 1080p and medium settings, we start brushing up against 100 frames per second on average. And overall, the gameplay is snappy and responsive, even when streaming over the network. And finally, I had to check out the Oblivion remaster. The game did warn me that I didn't have enough system memory in the VM, as I only assigned 12 gigabytes where the game requires 16, but it did launch anyway. In-game, even outdoors, we were seeing between 45 and 60 frames per second on average, making the game absolutely playable at 1080p and low settings. Without hardware ray tracing though, I wouldn't try to push the game any higher than that. Overall, I'm happy with the performance we got out of the Radeon Pro W5500, especially considering the $90 price tag. Again, it's not likely you're going to replace any existing gaming PC that you already have, but it makes a solid spare system, especially if you have idling hardware inside of your server. If you don't want to shell out $1,300 for one of the newest gaming handheld PCs, you can get better performance from this GPU and simply stream the gameplay to your laptop, phone, or even an Android handheld, and save quite a bit of money. Now, I also picked up this little gem at the same time. This is the Radeon Pro WX5100 based on Polaris, using the exact same GPU as the RX 470D. But I wasn't nearly as happy with the performance out of this one. You see, this is only a 70 watt TDP card as it's entirely bus powered. And while it has the same number of shader cores, it's just not nearly performant enough to replace anything that you might otherwise use. This didn't even match the performance of the Steam Deck to put it all into context. And the Steam Deck is designed for 720p gaming. So you can imagine how well things ran on this. Definitely not recommended. I would definitely say spend 40 more dollars and get yourself a W5500. And of course, there's nothing stopping you from running an even more performant video card in your server. You're only limited by the physical space that you have. But I like the W5500 because of its relatively low power draw at 105 watts and the fact that it's only a single slot GPU. Most of my servers have a ton of cards already installed, from multi-gig network adapters to HBAs to NVMe carrier boards. Even if I have an X8 or an X16 slot available, there's no guarantee that I have a second slot below it just for running a GPU fan. And for what I need, a remote gaming PC for my daughter to play on her laptop from, or for me to play on an Android handheld device, the W5500 more than fits the performance bill. Like I said, there are a bunch of different ways that you can game on a server, and this might be one of the more approachable and affordable options yet. Just chuck a $90 GPU into your server, run a bunch of free software, and play games from any device that you already own. If you're interested in picking up the Radeon Pro W5500 for yourself, I will have eBay affiliate links down in the video description. As a disclaimer, I do make money whenever you click on one of those links, and it does help keep the lights on around here. On your way down there, make sure to drop this video a like and subscribe to Craft Computing if you haven't done so already. Follow me on the social medias at Craft Computing for daily shenanigans like this. And if you like the content you see on this channel and want to help support me in what I do, consider joining the Patreon. Link is down in the video description. That's going to do it for me in this one. Thank you all so much for watching. And as always, I will see you in the next video. Cheers, everyone. I didn't drink much of this, but it's really, really good. It's just really intense. That's a different one. for today was sent over by Mr. Pink. It is from the Brewing Project in Eau Claire, Wisconsin. It is the Mixed Berry Chomp Chomp Imperial Sour Ale, clocking in at 6.9%. Nice. Oh, the berries are real in this one. <laughs> oh my gosh. That smells like cheesecake. Not even like an ale. Not even like a sour, that legit smells like cheesecake. I will say, that is not the most attractive beverage. There, the top of this is not level. There, there's bubbles that are forming. It looks like the texture of mold. Like, 
if you've ever left a glass out and then it just gets like that layer of crust on top, that's what the top looks like right now. Now I'm having a really hard time with that, but we're going to we're going to power through this. Way more sour than the aroma leads on. Way more sour. Wow. They were not lying about that. That is intense, <laughs> concentrated flavor. And I will say, every bit of flavor that they explain on the back of this can is coming through. Uh, Imperial Sour Ale, brewed with blackberry, raspberry, strawberry, blueberry, cream cheese powder, graham cracker flavoring, and vanilla. I get graham cracker. I get all of the mixed berries. I definitely get some creamy mist to it. I get the vanilla. I get, I get all of that. I'm not convinced this is not a beer. This might just be cheesecake with like a lager that they threw into a blender. <laughs> it's thick enough to be that. I am drinking this super slow, not because it's not good. It is just so concentrated and intense. I don't know if I'm going to be able to finish it. I'm really, really enjoying it. But it's one of those things that it's so saturated and it's actually so sour, it's difficult to keep drinking it. Especially when I'm trying to talk and read a script at the same time. It's filling my mouth with saliva every time I take a drink and then I'm having to spend 60 seconds swallowing so I can proceed with the next paragraph. This is really good, but maybe a four ounce taster is in order.